Hi everyone, I'm Bruno Aziza and welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is where we come to learn from data leaders, their success, their lessons. And today I'm excited to talk to Fabrizio, who's going to talk to us about the amazing success he's gotten at the company. Fabrizio, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, thanks Bruno. Thanks for hosting me today. So let's uh, dive right into it. Tell us about the company and what you do for them. I work for Swarovski. I joined the, the company a couple of years ago, and I'm leading the advanced analytics team in Swarovski. Swarovski is a company with a whole heritage. It has been there for more than 125 years, and uh, we basically create and we inspire our customers uh, with crystals and with crystal creation. And in the last decades, uh, the most important part of our business is in the jewelry space. So we create um, jewelry pieces uh, as home accessories and jewelers. Yeah. So you're 125 years, you've been in the market for a long time. So now how do you build this data culture and how do you use data to delight your customers and run your business more efficiently? So, yeah, that's the long heritage is somehow a pros and a cons, meaning that we have very consolidated way of working and very consolidated way of delighting our customers. But when it comes to data, this is a brand new stuff for the company, for a company like ours. So as you may imagine, we are not like in the FMCG market where we have tons of data. Uh, our customer comes on our side maybe once or two, twice in a year on average. And we have to make sure that we capture all from a data perspective, all the information and we understand what their, what are their intention, their ambition, uh, just with a very limited number of, of, of visibility about them. And that's a pretty big challenge from a data perspective. It's, it's super nice a challenge, but it's very, it's very tough, especially when you have to make sure that you collect all the data you rebuild the customer journey from the offline and the online behavior by making sure that you are using all the data you have. And second is that compared to other industries, I would say um, the purchase process is not that rational as it is in other in other industries where you can predict more or less or you can play with price and so on, and then you do the magics. While here in the, in the, in the jewelry industries, some most of times the purchase is spontaneous or comes from drivers that are not rational and this is where i would say the airy data <laughs> are not so easily able to capture and this is where we have to play more with the data that we have so you're telling us about customers here but i also know that you've experienced tremendous results with landing pages tell us more about that that's one of our first projects so i'm very proud of that and actually as you know, or as you may know, in the e-commerce website, uh, products are listed according to Sunru, right? So you, you jump on, on our website as a customer, you find the product uh, listed in a diff in any any different way, and the the, the number of products that are displayed in the top bar most often um, determine uh, the conversion on those products because I mean we as a customer tend to be lazy if there are, if there are thousands of products we won't be able to browse all of them so we want to find the very best product fitting for us in the upper part of this list the way it was usually done in Zwarowski was applying some business rules to make sure that the product that were supposed to be most interesting for the users and the customer were on top of those lists. We introduced a um, machine learning model to predict uh, the most performing um, uh, SKUs and product uh, to be placed on top of the list by considering both online and offline indicators. So to merge all of those information and to provide to every product a specific score to be used in the, in the product listing. We did, uh, we personalized the listing a, a, at country level. So now at country level, you have personalized listing. And from the result that we had, we uh, overcome and overcome the um, existing score by more than 12% in terms of conversion. So it worked very well. And this is a kind of examples how you could blend internal offline and online data to create those kind of insight. And we are aiming to expand this product listing page to personalize even more a customer level rather than only a country level. So this is where we are working on. And if we will have in future chance to discuss that, I will definitely provide you insight about how it's going. 
So we have the complexity of offline and online. We have the complexity of the type of decision and how decisions are made and the exactly. motivations behind that. And you're using data across customer channels and products. So tell us a little bit about the use cases themselves. What are some of the projects you've been working on and how are they going? So we, we started uh, we started our activities um, on the advanced analytics a couple of years ago, as I was saying. And at that point in time, it was more about yeah, using the data for reporting purposes. It wasn't about, I mean, advanced analytics was a kind of buzzword. Everybody wanted to do that, but nobody really wanted how to use that. And then we started to use the prescriptive and, and, and predictive analytics in our, in our portfolio. And we also started building up the foundation from a data perspective that is building up the data lake and all the analytic capabilities that with it on cloud on purpose to make sure that we could get enough scalability. And once we had the foundation, now, then it came to creating a portfolio of solutions that is, of course, evolving over time. And we basically have three main, what we call platforms, even if it's not technical platforms. One is about the customer. So that is a collection of application of advanced analytics application in the customer area. This is all about understanding the behavior, predicting the behavior of our customer, and serving our customer at best. The second big bucket is about the distribution. Here we have still the offline distribution covering 80% of our business. And that's pretty tricky from a data perspective as we cannot collect as many data points as we do for the online channel in the offline world, but we have to reconnect the offline and the online channel as we were discussing before. And the third big platform is about the product. It's, this is where we collect all the application on the product side, meaning understanding what goes well and what goes wrong with our product, uh, detecting the trends in the product and so on. So can we talk a little bit about the channel uh, application, particularly, you know, the the, the benchmarking tool, you know, how do you work that? What are some of the results? And what are some of the you know complexities you had to deal with yeah. in particular in data preparation? That's for me, that's one of the most exciting for a company like ours and in the in the um, retailer for a retailer, let's say in the retailer sector. What we are doing is to uh, build up a solution for uh, the potential analysis and prediction of our stores. As you can imagine, every store is different. Uh, it's different because it's located in a different location. It's different because, for instance, in our case, the flow of tourists is different and we rely a lot on our tourist uh, flows and so on. So there are a lot of forces and drivers that um, affect the performance of a store and, and its potential. We usually, in a company like ours, usually you compare the performance of a store according to, I don't know, the traffic or the value per ticket and so on. But this doesn't tell you the whole story, right? Because there are a lot of factors that you don't control. Like, I mean, in the pandemic, it was quite clear, right? I mean, there, are, there were forces that we didn't control. They make the difference between a store that has kind of same area, same store area as another one, but it's located in a much more visible window and so on. So what we are doing is building up a solution that includes both internal and external data and try to understand the gaps between high performance store and low performance store by projecting the potential of a store, including internal and external factors. And I mean, we are getting great results. Um, we are using data, we are establishing data partnership with uh, some um, credit card issue provider, issuer, sorry, and they provide us aggregated data about the performance of the area where we have our store. Or we grab data from telecommunication operator to understand the footfall and the mobility around our stores. We blend all those these data along with weather and so on, and we assess the potential of a store and we compare the result, the results of the store to analyze and to uh, define clear action or commercial actions on top of that. We uh, piloted that tool in, in, in one country in Europe, one big country, and we got amazing results since the very beginning. We were able to increase uh, the value per, per ticket of stores in the, in the pilot by 7%. Uh, we increased the traffic more than 14%. So we were really able to convert and to translate the business insights into actionable roadmap that could be implemented at store level. It worked pretty well then, and then we are uh, deploying the solution in the US. It will be starting from, from January 2022. So yeah, that's very exciting for us. 
this is a great example, particularly how you're trying to understand the intent and you're explaining to us that a lot of the intent is conditioned not just by the data you've got access to, but also external data. Uh, you mentioned credit card, but also I think it's football data. If there's a game in that AR and you're able to correlate that to the decision-making process of your prospects, and then you're seeing amazing results. So that's for channel distribution, benchmarking of various stores and the factors that are affecting the performance. What about the other areas? Like since we're talking about customers, what are we doing with customers and, and data in particular uh, to understand them a little bit more? Of course, on the customer, that's one of the most exciting part, uh, as of course, when we talk about the customer, you really touch the data about your, your people and your, the people who buys your product. So it's, it's a very relevant area. I would have plenty of examples there uh, as we are working really on 360 degrees on the entire customer journey. Probably the one that might be relevant or might be, let's say, an easy pick would be on the dormancy part. Once again, this is related to the low number of touch point data that we have about our customers. So it's very hard to understand or to predict whether our customer will purchase or, 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 or won't purchase anymore in future, even if it has a long lifetime, right? So this is where we have to play. And the hard part is when, is when it comes to predicting whether the customer is going to be dormant and making sure that we grab every relevant signals of dormancy beforehand. We developed a, a model that assigned a probability for a customer to become dormant by looking at the offline and the online. We notice we, we um, measure a great correlation between, of course, the online footprint and the and the predicted value over time. And we use all of that information to make sure that we can capture any signal of dormancy beforehand. We launched, we recently launched a campaign for winning back customers that are at risk of dormancy. And we got great results compared to Benchmark. Uh, we were able to acquire uh, more than 3% uh, of, of all the customer targeted. That looks low, but it's it's a massive amount if you if you think that our customer only purchase once or twice a year. So it's very hard to reactivate in a continuous base. So we are, I mean, that's a promising result. We'll definitely investigate it more, but it's a starting point that we want to leverage in future. That's outstanding. And so you've talked now about two examples here uh, that give us a really good sense of the complexity of data preparation, bring data together and getting insights that are actionable for your company. Now you've been doing this for a long time. You were at Telcom Italia for a long time as well. And so I know you've learned a lot throughout these years on what to do and what not to do. And so I wanna ask you if there were a few best practices, let's start with the positive. What would they be that everyone needs to think about to kind of achieve the type of results you're achieving here? I would say, uh, first of all, in the data science space, everybody is excited about data, right? And technology and so on. And if you talk about data scientists, he knows he does this sexy job and he only, only want to work with data, with new technologies and so on. But what I learned on the way is that anyway, you have to be very stick to the business question. So you have to start from a business question, making sure that even if you develop the most exciting model or machine learning model, then it should be strongly linked and strongly, yeah, strongly linked to a business question, making sure that whatever insight you get off, it's, it provides an answer to that question. So prioritization, be super um, linked to business. It's, 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 a key, it's a key element. And the second is, that in my experience, also as a consultant in the past, I saw many companies trying to boil the ocean since the very beginning. So they want to introduce advanced analytics, AI at scale without having a clear roadmap in mind and starting very big from huge uh, technological investment, huge uh, competence investment and so on, and then failing on the way. Uh, I would say my approach is I learned to be very pragmatic rather than boiling the ocean, starting, understanding that you will never have the perfect world to work with. You have to work with messy data. Sometimes you have to work with not very high quality data, but that's what, what you have. And if you are able to exploit it, to make treasure of that, and also bring results that are tangible for the company, then you get much more traction and you get much more sponsorship for the company. Even if most of the people around you do not understand what you're talking about, but they, they definitely give you credit and, and trust to, to go ahead. And I would say if I can have one, it's about one 
side that is also is all is often not very perceived as a value from a data scientist perspective that is giving the face to results so we usually we are as a data scientist we're usually very focused on uh, let's say creating the most performing model and the most let's say uh, powerful machine learning model to solve an issue but then we we, we often forget that then our business user and the consumer of that insight is a person that most of the time do not know what, what, what is the math behind. So I would say bringing a face to our results is a key element, meaning making sure that at the end of the day, we create a dashboard that shows the data that, that allows our user to play with the results and so on, create trust, create understanding, and also, I think, create the right traction to make sure that we can really affect the, the, the business processes. So be pragmatic. Don't forget the question you're, you're asking, and it's a business question. Don't get Absolutely. too excited. And then finally, make sure that you present the information in a way that your audience can relate to it. And those are great, positive best practices. We also like to ask you about the opposite of that, which yeah. are the things that people need to think about avoiding. Often, you know, it might be uh, logical at first, and then you realize down the path, down the road that, you know, if you if you'd had the choice, you would have done it differently. So, yeah. you know, what what have you learned uh, when it comes to those? One of the learning the rest a little bit from from the positive side that is avoid to be self-referential. So avoid to talk about data scientists and treat every problem as a machine learning problem just because you learn how to to make the math right. Uh, most of time, I mean, you, you really have to understand what is the best answer to a question. Sometimes it's just a rule-based model. Sometimes it's a very complex AI system, but avoiding to yeah, make the, um, the technology and the math as, as the driving force rather than, yeah, once again, providing an answer to a business question. So don't be self-referential for me from, from a data science perspective is, is one of the key elements to succeed. The second is, and that's where I think we found a good environment in, in the GCP, in the Google Cloud environment, is avoiding that to think that only R and Python are the answer for every, for every uh, problem. We like, I'm a computer uh, scientist, and we like to code everything, right? We, we, have, we like to have the full flexibility to code everything. But then you understand that sometimes creating a data pre-processing pipeline requires hundreds of final codes. And sometimes you just take an out of the box tool like data prep or whatever, and then you did the trick in, I don't know, a few clicks. So I think once again, it's about understanding that there is not a single tool or one solution fits all, but rather understanding that sometimes you may use other tools or out of the box machine learning environment, for instance, that helps that simply uh, makes your life easier. And I would, I would say the one extra extra uh, point is about thinking. We, we love dev, so we love we love the moment from the design from the, to transform the business answer into a model design, test it out, and that's it. Right? I mean, we usually like to think about dev and not too much think about ops because ops means a lot of work and sometimes isn't that sexy, but what it works in the companies is ops is not that. I mean, everybody's excited about a POC or whatever, but then if you want to really go to the next mile and making sure that whatever you do have an impact and, and make sense into a company, then you have to think about ops. And this is where, this is a shift of, I mean, a shift of mind, I would say. Uh, you have to think about ops since the very beginning, since the first data that you analyze. Of course, having the flexibility of working in dev and working in an innovation mindset, but always think about where you're heading, how you manage your, your product lifecycle, and how this should be, let's say, ha handed over to somebody that then manage that, uh, monitor, and operationalize that in, on the long term. And did you have to hire different folks then to help you develop this mindset on ops? Or it was it just a, a change in job description, a reminder to the team that they have to think about the financial operational aspects so they can develop better? How did you handle that? 
I don't like too much the role labels. I mean, I don't like to think about uh, data science as a specific uh, role with only specific competencies and the data engineering or a machine learning engineering. I think what I really pursue in the competencies, those flexible mindset where, of course, you, you shall have very foundation a very strong let's say background uh technical background statistical background and so on but this is where i mean that's something you find in a lot of people i would say what you don't find in a very (laughs) big uh audience is those soft skills and capability to adapt to make sure that they can really understand what the business is asking and they can also cover the extra mile that shouldn't be probably in their I mean, in the role description, but it's very, very helpful to make sure that their work is is embedded into the process in the right way. That's, I think that's a unicorn, that's the the, the, the driver between unicorn data scientists and normal data scientists. Yeah. So you're looking for those traits. Uh, So they're pretty wide uh, trait. Now you talked about this idea of uh, liking development and liking the code, of course. Uh, and you're a big user of uh, data prep. And so I'm curious because data prep is a very user friendly interface. What is your favorite feature of data prep? Oh, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of one of the latest features that they added actually. Um, that's a data quality monitor. So um, in the previous feature, they hadn't those, uh, those capabilities. Now they introduces the way to define data quality rules and then to monitor the result of the application of the rules along the way. So once the data has been processed or moved from one location to another one, that's once again, thinking about ops, this is definitely one uh, key element that we need and key feature that we need. And there is another big conversation with data prep. I'm happy about their new opening to uh, new connectors as when you build up a data lake, one of the first thing that you do is collecting data from multiple sources. They're expanding uh, those capabilities and we are in conversation with them to sponsor some of them as we are (laughs) super interested in some of those connectors. And what I like is that they are pretty open and and they are, I mean, they really work hard to to follow um, those directions and to make sure that their product will expand in that direction as well. Well, Fabrizio, thank you so much for sharing with us all these best and worst practices. I hope that people reach out to you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. And yeah, have a good day. And if you want to find out more about stories just like this one, be sure to click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Ziza.